later. They better do a little scene for the play later on. So that's the only question. <laughs> Unless, oh, so how did you? Yeah, yeah why did, how did you? Just yeah. explain it. Have to ask some questions. Yeah. Explain it. Sure. All right. So uh, your project was to write a, a produce a play, write a play, and produce it from the. No, no. just um, direct. Just direct and produce. Yeah, it's an already written play. It's an already written play. Yeah. So uh, what went into choosing this play? Uh, well, I uh, I talked to my acting teacher and. I looked around and read a lot of plays, and um, I don't know, I guess this one kind of spoke to me because it's about a teenager and his relationships um, with other people, which I can relate to, obviously. Um, but it's also really it's interesting because it's about this guy and his um, mother commits suicide, and so it's when he's about six. when he's six. So it's about his relationships with women, all the rest of the women in his life for the rest of his life. Uh, so it's pretty interesting. The play is on June 8th. We're doing two shows. It's a one Seven act. Seven and a nine in the Little Theater. And the rest of the cast couldn't be here tonight because they're in Twelfth Night. But Jane Bird, Elise Terry, and Campbell Payne are also in it. I'm Rebecca Patterson. Russell Peck. He directed it. She got it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. For my project, I um, sponsored a tournament at my Taekwondo school. The tournament was focused on the younger kids because we don't, for our Taekwondo foundation, we don't have a lot of support in this region. So anytime we want to travel or do a tournament, we have to go up to Canada or to Colorado or to San Diego. So I wanted to make a smaller tournament for littler kids so that they could figure out what a tournament's like before they go up to Canada and decide that they hate it. So um, what I did is I we invited some of the other schools from the region and we put together a little tournament. It was it was really instructional. It wasn't there wasn't so much it wasn't very competitive. It was more instructional and we taught about the rules and the regulations and all the etiquette you have to have. And it went very well. The kids learned a lot, and I think a lot of them will be accompanying us to Wisconsin this summer. And what's your name? Uh, Samantha Glassberg. Thank you very much. No problem. <laughs> All right, anytime. Anytime? Okay. I'm Zach Bambathoris. I did hypnosis. Um, I researched it, and this is all the stuff I've learned. I've um, also practiced a ton of it. I do self-hypnosis every night before I go to bed. Uh, it's really nice for relaxation, and when it's stressed, I could use it to calm myself down and public speaking. I've also hypnotized friends, family. I've hypnotized hypnotists before, and I've just learned a lot, and I'm going to continue using it in my entire life, and in college especially. So if, if you had trouble getting to sleep at night, would you hypnotize Exactly, yourself? that's what I do every night. Well, I'll have to be back. That's my problem. So. All right, thank you very sure. much. Uh, hi, I'm Alex Van Leer, and I did mine on uh, meditation. Um, this is just—I did a slideshow, but I printed out some of the slides, and I spent the past I don't know two months attempting to learn. I went to a bunch of different centers and read a bunch of books on all types of meditation, from I don't know, Buddhism to uh, Jewish meditations to this New Age meditations. And um, I've also began meditating myself and trying to learn how to meditate. I uh, talk a lot about the, what it's like to start to meditate and the difficulties, and, but also the benefits. Fits in the, uh, different things like that. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kind of like snuck up and like sat down right in the front and just snapped pictures on. Yeah. yeah. All digital. I've actually just learned film like this past summer. I've been doing photography for like longer than that. So it's kind of a backwards way of learning things because I learned digital first and then. Well, it's kind of easy for your generation. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Started off a little black and white. Right. And it was a way of getting out of class and being yeah. black and white photography. Yeah, yeah. So I'm definitely a new generation. Yeah, yeah. 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 You have to learn a little more about light and the splitting and the filters. And yeah, exactly. You don't have None of it. <laughs> it's all like press this button and then turn it on. Is that an auto? Is that yeah, an yeah, yeah, yeah. Hi, I'm Molly Nexus. This is my project. I technically started my freelance design company, but I did a lot of portfolio building and I built a website. And uh, it's on the computer. And, um, can you build? It's an online portfolio, and you just kind of go over and scroll over the pictures, and they display. As you scroll over. Um, I'm in the process of writing a novel. Then I also have a. 
graphic um, design based on private investigation. And along the way, I've read cards, seven, a logo, nine books. Uh, poster, These are just like mandala, the three, probably most another poster, uh, yearbook layout, the style that I'm trying to write. Uh, another poster, a, uh, just kind of a surreal imagery piece, a self-portrait, and uh, just another graphic. And, uh, these are some traditional How I started was I actually one night about and, the social Yeah, that's, that's about it, so I'm free to explore. There's uh, my resume on there, right, <laughs> so you can see um, that you're like hiring me or something. In a hotel room. When doing that, I wasn't sure whether I wanted to write a full-out novel or a group of short stories. So there's another plan for a story in there about the last guy on Earth and what he would do. You know, everyone's gone. You know, he's just doing his, he's out there doing his own thing. Um, but then that actually develops into, I started realizing I wanted to do a novel, and this is the first draft of the private investigator thing. And I started writing that, you know, days doing some work, doing some work. Five pages into it, I really decided I didn't like where it was going. Completely scrapped it, started over again. Same story, same idea on this over here, which is about 16, 17 pages of writing. And I just started really liking where that was going. I completely redid the introduction. Nothing is the same. I used nothing from this except the basic story. I covered the entire place And um, I just really like where that's going, and that's my current draft. Okay, well, I'm Deirdre Offenheiser, and I decided to research genealogy um, for my project. I was interested in this particular idea because uh, my family has so many photo albums, and I've always seen the pictures but never really um, gotten the stories behind them. Um, so I thought that this would be a perfect way to um, to learn a skill that I could continue after high school and learn a little bit more about my family in the process. Um, so some of the things I did were I interviewed my grandfather and um, I, I managed to track my family on his side that way. I learned about my um, Irish relatives, um, some of which, um, uh, one of which actually is a famous advertising mogul who um, who started um, as a first-generation Irish immigrant in the mailroom of an advertising um, company and ma later managed to become the president of it. Um, I also, um, through talking to other relatives, managed to, um, on my mother's side, um, trace um, my mother's family back to the 1500s in France. Um, so it was a, a very interesting project. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is your final side, right? Yeah. If you paternal. Paternal. Yeah. 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 Yeah, there's a lot of help with this now with the internet. Right? I noted different ways of um, of studying genealogy. You can do it online. There's a lot of databases online um, that you can study in order to um, find different pedigrees for your family, since. Um, um, actually, uh, much of um, what you might look for, other people have already compiled um, because um, you, you might be distantly related to them. Um, and there's a lot of stories and um, information about everyday life um, that's very interesting in terms of putting your family history in context. Um, he, his name was Patrick Conway, and he came to from Ireland um, to New York, and then to Long Island, and founded this little town called Southwold, um, where my my grandfather still lives. And there's a cemetery um, named after um, one of Patrick's brothers, and there's a, a church named after Patrick. So it's. It's a great little story. Uh, I'm Sheldon Pei, and I did a pres I did my senior project on how model rockets work. But in all my poster is basically how the engine of the model rocket works in a multi-stage rocket, which I have right here. This is a three-stage rocket, and in a three-stage rocket, it consists of two booster model, two booster engines, and one regular engine. And the booster engine, as you can see here, only has the black powder propellant, which is basically what drives the is the force that drives the rocket up. Then 
it keeps on going and going until he gets to the regular engine that has the delay charge, which you see the black smoke on the rocket, which you can locate it easily, the rocket easily in the sky, so you have no troubles finding it. Then the ejection charge is in the clay cap is actually what causes the nose ring to go off and eject the parachute or whatever device you have to reduce the drag. And then that's basically it. I can't think unless you have questions. I can't really think of anything. So, well, these are these these engines are something you buy at the model store, the uh, hobby store, right? Yeah, hobby store. Uh, there are some there are some higher class engines like M and L and N, I think, which you have to have a special license, and those engines are big enough and strong enough to be modern rockets. Like they could be used as weapons if they're if they're designed nice um, properly. I'm, I'm Wells Matson and I focused on leadership theories. I did some research and analyzed various leadership theories. Um, one of which was versatile leadership. It's a MIT Sloan developing your versatile leader and then I focused on true north and good to great which is about level five leadership and being authentic in the workplace be it politics business whatever um, they're there and they're real and they're very popular so what I did was I took the best of all three coalesced them into one and I have my own theory called synthesized leadership which focuses on perseverance uh, intelligence, resilience, and authenticity. And when you have those four together, uh, you are the complete synthesized leader, which I talk about in my PowerPoint presentation. And that's what I did for my senior project. Hi, I'm Kristen Walters. I did an internship at the Concord Middle School at Sanborn. And these are the books that I read during the semester that I worked with Miss Sears, seventh and eighth grade guidance counselor. And I set up three situations and three cases that I observed while I was there. And on top is the case um, with some of the details changed. And underneath is what um, the professional guidance counselor actually did for the situation. So you were a guy, you were studying the JR? Yeah, well, I'm going into um, human development at Boston College next year, so I wanted a little bit of experience um, before I go into that field. So. Um, it was basically an internship with a guidance counselor for 7th and 8th graders. So you were, you were practicing, you were sort of an apprentice guidance counselor? I mostly observed what she did. Uh, I was uh, trying to restore thank you very much. All right, thank you. I'm Iman Sagaf, and for my senior project, I did a project on embroidery, and I did some of my own embroidery pieces, and I researched a little more about embroidery, read some, a uh, little bit in books about embroidery in different cultures, and looked at Louise Bourgeois' use of embroidery in a more modern form, as well as looking at some um, more old-fashioned patterns. So I enjoyed senior project. It was a lot of fun. I'm going to take some pictures here. Right? Okay. <laughs> so what's involved in embroidery here? What do you do with this? Oh, yeah. um, you start with a ring here, it looks like. Yeah, you use, like, yeah. these are embroidery hoops that you use. Um, you have to, like, pull it tight enough. There's um, this bobbin. You can wind thread onto these. And then it's a lot easier to use. And I use this DMC. Red. And have these handy carry cases. Like on college visits, I could take them and put on the train ride. And I also tried using um, canvas and using a painting and then embroidering over it. I'm uh, Andrew Proughton, and uh, I, uh, I worked on a 1965 uh, Plymouth Sport Fury. It was it was fun, um, but you know it's, it still needs a lot of work. We bought it and it was just it's completely rusted. You know we didn't realize the guy had bond all over it. Yeah, it's, it was it's a good it's a good project. So you restored a car. Well, yeah, we we tried to, um, but we didn't have enough time to finish. I mean, it's going to take at least another year to get it close to done. Um, but you know it's. It, I did a, we did a lot of work on it, you know, it doesn't, if you can see some of the pictures, it doesn't really look like we did that much work, but 
it, we, we worked our butts off on it all the time, you know. And, uh, you know, it's, we're, we're, we're going to stick with it. Well, how do you get credit for that? Do you have to write a paper or do you have to make a presentation? Is that the um, well, there's a couple things. We have to keep journal entries whenever we work on it. Um, and then, of course, there's this presentation. We just make a little poster and talk to people, tell, tell them what we did. And um, there's also we have to do a self-evaluation. Um, we just have to write like a short little you know, page or two about you know, what we did. What we learned, that's the most important, is just what, what we learned, you know. And then um, finally there's going to be a big presentation um, later on this month. Mine's, I think, on the 22nd. We have people come down. I'm going to show off the car, you know, rev the engine and stuff. And, you know, it's, 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 it's a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. Thank you very much. No problem. Yeah, because this is... This is, these are one of the easiest setups to do. Where do you get the, the solar panels and stuff? Um, well, those big, the big thermal panels we had, my father got those a while back. Yeah. Um, so we've had those for a while, and then this, they go up, like this right here is just um, silicon, uh, silicon crystals, so those are the cheapest ones, but the photovoltaics are more expensive. They take a little longer to pay off, but they're good because, you know, if it's, you know, you're not at your house in the day, you have a few things on, you know, say, you know, you have a few lights on, you have clock radios and stuff. I mean, that stuff is on every day. It might take, not take a lot of energy, but it's on every day, and it's using energy every day. So, you know, this one generates 110 watts, so that would be going into your house powering that stuff. And if you have excess, it goes back onto the grid and makes your electricity meter turn backwards, so that saves you money. And, like, if you have a battery, you can power a battery that if you need to, and if there's a power outage and you have bank of batteries that you've powered with the solar panel, you can, you know, you can hook them in and run something, you know, something critical, like heating system, refrigerator, something like that, alarm system backup. Like, we have a battery like that for our alarm system, so. Yeah. Very good. Good job. I'm Greg Pru. Um, I just did a project on applications of solar energy around the home and how you can use it just as, because it's a sustainable resource, the sun's not going to be gone for a long time, so how you can use it to get both electricity and hot water, which are both good ways to save money on electricity and also to help conserve fossil fuels because they're only a finite, finite resource, so, you know, the more you can save, the better, and it's, 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 a, good, it's a good renewable energy source because you know, the sun's shining every day, the, the, uh, the planet, more solar energy falls on the planet in an hour than the world uses in a whole year, so it's a, it's a good resource to take advantage of. Well, now, what have you done besides dragging this equipment uh, here? Well, I've just been doing a lot of different research on, you know, the different, you know, how you can apply, like, photovoltaics, like, what the payoffs are, how, um, you know, how expensive it is. There are lots of different kinds of panels. Um, and just how long it would, you know, take to pay itself off. And also, um, situations in which it's really useful, you know, especially homes that are off the grid or also for things, you know, if you have an RV trailer, have a solar panel on that, get power for that, power things like that, you know, you have a pool, have something like this, get hot water for the pool on a really sunny day, and just reduce energy costs and environmental impact. Well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, my name is Eric Scro, and I'm a senior, obviously. Um, basically, what I was trying to do is I wanted to do something with philosophy, because that's my college major. And, you know, I started off by reading Nietzsche. I was listening to lectures by Robert Solomon on existentialism. But this really was, you know, I wasn't going to have a final project. Oh, hey. So, basically, I decided on doing a documentary, and for my documentary, I wanted to gather all the perspective I could. I interviewed some natives of the Caribbean island, I interviewed a rabbi, I interviewed a reverend, I interviewed my family, I interviewed my best friend. I'm really just trying to get everyone's opinions on, you know, how they came to believe what they believe. Because that's what I'm trying to get to, is the origins. And so, the reason I have the story of the elephant and the blind men is because I mean, when I was talking to the Reverend, he gave some of the most amazingly articulate answers I've ever heard. And if someone has a camera point on your face like you do right now, and they're asking you all these questions, it's really tough. And 
he just came up with some of the most articulate answers I've ever heard. And when I asked him, I asked him, how can you justify, as a Christian, the existence of Judaism, Islam, Scientology, how can you justify all these different things? He told me the story of the elephant and the blind man. And basically what that is, is, you know, these blind men approach this elephant. They put their hands in every different part. You know, one person grabs a tail. He can get his hand around it, but it's very flimsy. Another guy, you know, wraps his arms around one of the legs. And it's sturdy, but he can't quite get his arms around it. And the point is, we're all touching the same thing. And that's how we justify how, you know, cultural, geographical reasons all influence the way in which we choose to fill the void that is there if we don't subscribe to religion or you know, some scientific belief. And, you know, that's what I try to do, is just create a documentary that, you know, doesn't have a thesis telling you what to believe, but it's just going to enable people to draw from it what they need to and just gain perspective. Because I think the way in which you do that is through talking to different people and how they digest and internalize the world around them, and that's really what I try to do with the fucking art. Thank you. How do we end up with doubles here? The only problem I have is that people are yelling right behind you, that's the way the sound sounds. Yeah. See, I've been just looking at this. That's the only thing I've been saying. Okay. Uh, my name is Eric Seifer, and I built uh, model aircrafts for my presentation, my senior project. And originally what I did was, first thing I did was build a scale model of um, a kit model, uh, what's called, what's commonly called an almost ready to fly model. And, if, and those models are by far the most common uh, uh, RC models that are out there today because they're, easy, they're relatively easy to build, yet there's still a fair amount of construction involved. And then after I finished that, I studied the general way that a wing creates lift, the way engines work, and this one is specifically, this is a two-cycle engine, which is by far the most common type of engine that's used for uh, RC air, radio control aircraft. And then went on to design my, my wing here, which is by far the most important part of the aircraft. Hold it up here. Is that aluminum on the wing there? Yes, this is aluminum. Can you look around while you something? That's actually the same uh, NC aluminum that they use on printing presses, so it's real thin and it's very light and it's strong. Uh, you know, it's high grade aluminum. And there's a lot of variables that go into designing the wing, and obviously that's the most important part of the aircraft because it's what makes the aircraft fly and determines most of the characteristics of how it flies and what you want to do with it, whether you want to use it for aerobatics, whether you want it to be easy to fly, fly fast or slow. And uh, there's a number of things that go into that, including uh, you want the wing... Uh, the ratio of the area of the wing to the weight of the wing. You want to be about somewhere in the area between 20 and 30 ounces per square foot of wing, which is a little over a pound. And then there's a number of, there's a number of other factors, but including uh, wing dihedral and various other things that can make the aircraft easier or harder. So where, where, where do you do your flying? Where I do my flying, um, actually there's a um, uh, model aircraft club uh, up in Nashua, or an RC aircraft club up in Nashua that, um, that you know, you join, there's a membership and you can go fly aircraft there for a certain price every month and they actually have runways and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I'm Doug Weand and uh, I did my senior project on the cultural impact of video games on children as well as the evolution of video games over time. Uh, I have here some uh, information regarding the current usage of video games. It's been shown that video games are becoming increasingly more, uh, increasingly more of a part of, of children's lives, uh, for better or for worse. Uh, a lot of the research indicates that uh, that that video games can be a very powerful learning tool, and this is a good thing in that educators will be starting to use them to teach their children. Uh, uh, I mean, pretty much anything, but. The, the problem arises when parents uh, allow their children to get their hands on uh, violent and uh, graphic video games. And this is a real problem because 
because uh, the kids pick up these habits, and it's been proven that uh, video games of a violent nature, uh, when played during a child's developmental period, can, <coughs> can trigger uh, aggression and uh, other negative uh, impacts. So basically what I do is I, I, I put together all the research and I put some questionnaires out and I interviewed parents and I interviewed game developers and I'm putting together a documentary. Uh, this is right over here, this is a, a little piece of it. This actually is just tracks the evolution of games from uh, their first inception, which is in uh, the 50s all the way to modern uh, games. And over here I have uh, a fully interactive station with uh, the latest technology. And uh, actually, what I believe is progress for, for games because it's, it's no longer, uh, over here I mean it's, it's new and it's really cool to play this on the one hand, on the other hand it's not violent uh, and it's actually you know, somewhat active because you, you actually move the controllers around to control the game instead of sort of sitting down. You're you know, up and about uh, and you're playing you know, tennis with your friends so it's really a, a social tool on a whole new level that's never really been uh, discovered before. So I, I really believe that this is the next step for, for video games and this is where, where games will really start to be a mainstream part of the household and will be used by people of all ages, not just children. Uh, I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I did, my project is. Uh, and basically, how this works. This is a game of virtual tennis. Uh, and this actually is, this is interesting here because right here. I'd like to invite you all to come over to the music room, the orchestra room, and the band room. We have a couple of performances. Uh, let's make our way over there. Well, I mean, this is, this is actually a really interesting example right here. This, this game actually suggests that you take a break, so it's really trying to encourage responsible use of these games. Anyway, so this is a game of, of virtual tennis, and you use these controllers like you would use a tennis racket. It's very, it's fully interactive. Uh, you can, and uh, you know, it's it's, act, it's and you are actually moving around instead of sitting down. Uh, oh, you're red on the All right. So to serve the ball, here you. Um, you actually toss up the ball and then you hit it, and it goes in. It's just like normal. You need an expert to show. All right, so and you 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 hit it with it. It's really easy. It's really a simple procedure. You just toss it up, serve it. If I for a backhand, do I have to go? Yeah, you have to do. You have to hit it like you hit it normal. There you go. Your serve now. Okay. All right. Pick the guy. So this thing? Yeah. Okay. No, you just toss it up and hit it. Oh wait, I think it's over. Yeah, that's the game. Begins. Barely getting started. All right, actually. Level forty. Yeah. All right, one more time. I have to keep going. I'm actually helping someone perform. But yeah, one more time. Just too briefly. All right. I'm all side. Yeah, I'm serving. Anyone okay. serve? No. Oh, I missed it. Go for it. Thank mm -hmm. you.
interesting graphics. Uh, what you're about to see is a short uh, scene from the opening uh, of a novel. Uh, so. Beep Walker was busy at her computer screen when she got the message. She stopped what she was doing and answered the call. I need help. I'm hurt and separated from my squad. Please repeat, where are you? Beep recognized the voice and hoped she could help. I bailed out about five miles on the wrong side of no man's land. There should be a ground radar facility nearby, but I can't see a thing. Can you walk? Beep realized a rescue was not likely. He'd have to make it out on his own. She hoped he could walk, or even better, run. My right leg took a hit, but I can move. Fear seeped through his voice. Beep knew he was right to be afraid. Do you know how to get to the river? It's east. Go there, but stay low. Wait, I see a small hill where I can get a better view. I'll find the radar base from there. I'm gonna climb. Don't do it. Stay low. No, this is good. I'll be able to see. No! Snipers! Get out of there! Stay low and move toward the river. Crawl if you have to. I'm surrounded. Help! Beep knew it would be all over soon. The whole mission had been in vain. She closed her eyes and waited for the shots. No, I'm, I'm hit. Are you there? Repeat. Are you there? Rats. I'm dead. <laughs> I'm dead. I really thought I'd finally had this level beat. I was so close to the checkpoint. Now I have to start level 9 all over again. This is so frustrating. Thanks for trying, Beep. No problem, Toby. Next time, when level 9 starts, stay low. The snipers can't see you if you're low, so drop to the ground and stay there. So I just keep hitting the down key the whole time? Ugh. It's gonna make it so hard to aim. I guess I could try to use my left hand. Well, there's a cheat code you can use to put you in a permanent crawl. Beep Walker? Qu'est-ce que c'est? This is a language lab, not a computer game. <laughs> she grabbed Beep's arm. This is not the grammar lesson. Vous êtes in trouble now. She glared at Beep. Little shooting men, Beep, this is the final straw. Off to the principal. This is the end for you. It was the end for all of us. <laughs> I'm actually going to read the uh, Oh, my God. Okay. This is sort of a little background. And uh, thanks very much again to uh, Eric Stengrevix and Lucy Nowski. Uh, this is actually the first scene from a novel uh, that I worked on as part of a senior project. The story of the project actually started in seventh grade when I wrote what was then a short story, which my teacher suggested I then try to have published. The story stayed on my shelf for a few years, but in the summer after my freshman year in high school, I decided to get serious. What was meant to be the second draft of a short story turned into a 125-page manuscript. I researched the publishing world. I became savvy enough to realize that what I needed was a literary agent, and I was naive enough to think I could actually get one. Too young to know better, I sent letters to 50 literary agencies, and all rejected me. I spent the next summer completely rewriting the manuscript with more focus on character and character development. To ensure the clarity of plot details, I also <coughs> spent more time on research. By the next school year, I was ready to try again with the newly renamed Cheat Codes. By this time, I was more methodical. I sent letters to three agents who I thought would be the most interested in my genre of writing, and I readied myself for more rejection. Then the improbable happened. Two of the three agents offered me a contract, and I signed with the Curtis Brown Literary Agency in New York. However, even at this stage, the story needed more work. The main character wasn't as clearly defined as I wanted. There were too many minor characters, which was confusing and there was too much telling of the story instead of showing the story through dialogue. These were not minor edits. Getting rid of all references to certain characters, cutting entire chapters, writing new chapters, re rewriting se selected paragraphs, and changing the entire tone of passages is not something that can be done in a few afternoons. For my senior project, I focused on doing all of these major revisions. In conjunction with this project about writing, I met with publishers and editors to learn more about their jobs. I received a tour at Houghton Mifflin, a publishing company in Boston, and had a three-hour lunch conversation with an editor about my manuscript and the publishing industry. This allowed me to approach the process of refining my manuscript with a broader perspective. I'm very thankful for the time I was able to spend on this project during the school year and for the structure the senior project program offered. It has been an absolutely wonderful experience. Thank you very much. Media here. We've had music, we've had fiction, we have drama. Uh, Russell Peck has chosen and is the 
process of performing a one-act play. Uh, we're going to have a little snippet of it here, and Russell is going to explain a little bit and perform with Becca. Thank you, Russell. Hi, I'm Russell Peck. Um, we are doing the um, one-act Women and Wallace by Jonathan Mark Sherman, um, and it's going up June 8th. It's running two performances that night at 7 and a 9 in and a little free. theater. And it's free. And it's free. <laughs> um, and uh, Jane Bird, Becca, Elise Terry, and Campbell Payne are all in it. I directed it. But uh, Elise, Campbell, and uh, Jane are in Twelfth Night. So they couldn't be here. So that goes nice enough to come by and uh, do a scene. I'll be reading for Campbell. Um, so we're going to do a scene and a monologue. And the first scene is um, Wallace and his friend Victoria who just gone on a date, uh, they're first 13 date. years old, 13 years old, first date, um, <laughs> to the movies, and they're coming to a park. It's a little rough. <laughs> <laughs> we still have scripts, sorry. It's <laughs> okay. Um, Good movie. Yeah. I like the kissing stuff. I like when the girl dies. <laughs> <laughs> you want to sit down here? Here? Yeah, sure. Yeah, sure. You, you want a juju fruit? No, they stick to your teeth. You want a mallow cut? Chop that makes you break out. <laughs> oh. upset stomach, and drinking this helps. It isn't that bad, actually. You want some? <laughs> no, thanks. <laughs> I'll pass. It's such a nice day out. Yeah, it's not bad. <laughs> I don't want to go back to school, do you? Oh, I'm just dying to sharpen my pencils and do tons of homework every night. Do you think 8th grade is going to be any different than 7th grade? <laughs> no chance in hell. It's all the same. I don't think it matters. They just keep us in school until we're safely through our growth spurts and all the puberty confusion, then send us out to make the best of the rest of our lives. And we get so terrified of the real world that we pay some university to keep us for 4 more years or 8 more years or whatever. It all depends on how terrified you are. My grandmother's uh, brother is 62. He's still taking classes up in Chicago. <laughs> If you keep you long enough to get comfortable when you're young, they've got you for life. Not me, that's for sure. Once I'm out, I'm out. I'm not going to college, no way. What are you going to do? Who knows? Sit on the beach, get a really solid tan, watch lots of movies, dance. Sounds pretty stimulating, Victoria. Don't tease me. I wasn't teasing you. Yes, you were. I swear, I was not teasing you. Why would I tease you? You didn't like the kissing stuff? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> you know, in the movie? Oh, I don't know. Sure you do. <clears throat> I was getting candy. I missed it. <laughs> Leave me alone. You want to try? Try what? That. What's that? Kissing. <laughs> <laughs> you mean with you? Yeah. You mean now? Yeah. Um. Scared? Yeah, right. Go ahead, kiss me. You sure? Sure, Dinah. Dinah? Forget it. Will you kiss me already? Okay. <laughs> you didn't fade out. Nope. I think I love you, Victoria. <laughs> 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 What's wrong, Wallace? You're moving way too fast! That's what's wrong! <laughs> <laughs> too fast? I mistook love for a girl who ate juju fruits. <laughs> My mother
Mother's Turtlenecks by Wallace Kirkman, age 16. My mother loved my father and hated her neck. She thought it was too fleshy or something. If I hated my neck, I'd have it removed, but my mother never trusted doctors, so she wore turtlenecks. All the time. In every picture we have of her, she's wearing a turtleneck. She had turtlenecks in every color of the rainbow. She had blacks, she had whites, she had grays, she had plaids, she had polka dots, and houndstooth checks, and stripes, and Mickey Mouse, and even a sort of mesh turtleneck. I can't picture her without a turtleneck on. Although, according to Freud, I try to. Every moment of every day. <laughs> we have a photograph of me when I was a baby wearing one of my mother's turtlenecks. Swimming in one of my mother's turtlenecks is more like it. Just a bald head and a big shirt. It's very erotic in an edible shirtwear sort of way. It's a rare photograph because I'm smiling. I didn't smile all that much during most of my childhood. I'm taking lessons now, trying to learn again, but it takes time. I stopped smiling when my mother stopped wearing turtlenecks. I came home from typical day in the second grade to find her taking a bath in her own blood on the kitchen floor. Her turtleneck was on top of the kitchen table so it wouldn't come between her neck and her knife. I understood then why she'd worn turtlenecks all along. To stop the blood from flowing. To cover the wound that was there all along. They tried to cover the wound when they buried her with one of her favorite turtleneck dresses, but it didn't matter. It was just an empty hole by then. My mother wasn't hiding anymore. She wrote a note before she died asking to be cremated, and I asked my father why she wasn't. He said my mother was two women, and the one he loved would have been scared of the flames. I look at that photograph of little me inside my mother's shirt all the time. It's the closest I can get to security. There are no pictures of me inside my mother's womb, but her turtleneck is close enough.
there are refreshments. I hope we can all return for a little while. Um, there is a bumper sticker, which you might pick up for a small contribution by the refreshment table. Uh, Touting Senior Project, a bridge to the future. Uh, I want to tell people that this is the 12th annual Senior Project. Uh, Cochran Carlisle was the first high school in the state of Massachusetts to have one. Uh, we have been a prototype, and now there are several all over the state and uh, nationwide. But um, in Massachusetts, it started right here. Thank you all for coming very much. Thank you.